good. Let's get started. Welcome to the third lesson. And this lesson, the remaining time, we will dedicate it completely to live demos and doing a, a little bit of coding in Visual Studio and things like that. Before I go into the uh, topic, any questions regarding our last lesson about .NET Framework, .NET Core, .NET 5? It could happen that in your first exam, you will not only have to write code, but maybe you can also get a short multiple choice test where I might ask you questions like, what is the latest platform, .NET Framework, .NET Core, .NET 5? What is, .NET what is .NET standard? It will be a multiple choice test. So be prepared. Um, maybe you rewatch the video of our second lesson, then you will be absolutely uh, ready for, for the exam. So it might happen that I ask you small theory questions, but not in depth. Definitely, the, the most important part is practical programming. Good. So now let's go into Visual Studio. And we will do it in two ways. First, um, I will go into the, the terminal and let's stick here. You don't need to follow along. You can just, you can just watch and um, yeah, I recorded it. If you already have the tools installed, feel free to follow along. Next time you should follow along, okay? So let's create a folder. Let's say hello.net, something like this. And yeah, this folder is currently, as I, as I said, it's, it's currently empty, okay? In this folder, I would like to now create a .NET application. And I wanted to show you that it's absolutely not necessary to start Visual Studio for that. For that, you have the .NET CLI, the .NET tool. This .NET tool allows you to um, do a lot of things. As you can see it here, it allows you to create new projects, it allows you to add references to packages on NuGet. Who doesn't know what NuGet is? NuGet? NuGet. You don't know what NuGet is. Okay. Do you know what NPM is? The Node Package Manager. Yeah. yeah? NuGet is like NPM for C Sharp. Okay. Do you know what Maven is for Java? Yeah. yeah? NuGet is like Maven for Java, but for C Sharp. Do you know what PIP is? for Python. NuGet is like pip for Python, okay? It's a package manager. And if you want to use any existing library, maybe I ask you to do some CSV file parsing, comma separated value parsing, you will get the library from NuGet. Where do you get the C Sharp compiler from? NuGet. Where do you get the web server for ASP.NET Web APIs for, from? NuGet. The answer is always NuGet, okay? NuGet.org, you can, yeah, there's a nice, nice UI and things like that. You can take a look at it. It's not that important. But yeah, this is what Ed does. You can build your apps. You can um, publish your apps. You can run your apps. You can run automated tests and many, many other things. So if you are in a Linux environment, for instance, or a Mac, and you would like to create a .NET application completely without Visual Studio, you can do that by just using the .NET CLI. Now, I will say .NET new, and what .NET new will give me is a list of possible templates. The .NET tool contains a templating engine that is extensible. So many developers out there, many open source teams, they create templates for quickly creating a, a an application which uses their platform, for instance. And you can see, you can build console apps, you can build a class library, .pf, winforms, you will see ASP.NET Core, you will see Razor class libraries, you can create Razor apps, you can use Blazor apps, and many other different types of apps. Question. Uh, the, screen is cut on the, the screen is cut on the left side. I don't know why. Um, but that's not a problem. We will fix that now. Should work like that. Okay, good. So let's create a .NET console app. Just to say .NET new console. You can do that even if you don't have .NET 5 installed. That's fine. And this will create a console app, the most simple app on earth. And we can say .NET run. And it will run and it will say, what a surprise, hello world. 
Now let's take a look and this time I'm not going to use Visual Studio but I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. Give me a second, I will align to the video beamer and increase the font size a little bit. I hope you can read it even from the back rows. Um, yes. Now if we take a look then we will see we have of course C-sharp files, nothing special here. But now comes the important thing. Here we see the csproj file. The csproj file is the file that turns the folder into a C-sharp project. It's like a package JSON file for a Node.js or Angular application. The csproj file is where you configure the content of your project. And exactly here you specify what we did in the last lesson. If you want to build on the latest and greatest version of .NET, you add .NET 5.0 here. Does anybody know how this is called? Probably not. That would be surprising. This .NET 5.0, it's the so-called Target Framework Moniker, TFM. You read about it a lot if you do serious .NET development. The Target Framework Moniker. If I would like to switch, for instance, to a class library, I could say .NET Net Standard uh, 2.1. Oh, I, I, I had a typo here, so yeah. Oh, sorry. But you get the idea. I will show you that in Visual Studio, that's easier. But for the latest version, just type net 5.0 and everything is perfectly fine. Here you can define whether you want to build an executable or a class library or whatever, and you can add lots and lots and lots of options in that area. Um, yeah, typically you do that in a GUI, but it is possible to do it directly here. So yeah, that's it. Um, now let's switch to Visual Studio and do exactly the same in Visual Studio so we have a nice GUI. So let's create a console app, console app here, and you see console app, it currently still says .NET Core. Can you read it from the back? If you can't, it says .NET Core. Why? Because we are building an executable. But take a look what the Visual Studio says to class libraries. It says class library, .NET standard. This is exactly what I told you before. If you build a class library, .NET standard. If you build an app, .NET Core. And with .NET 5, there will not be any distinction anymore. It will just be class library and app and everything is .NET 5. Got the difference? Okay, so you are lucky. You started with C Sharp with this C Sharp course now. So forget about this whole core and standard for the future. It's only history. It's only backwards compatibility. So let's create a console app here next. Uh, let's put it in my temp folder. Um, yeah, let's say hello.net, something like this. Nothing special. Let's click on create. And it will give us hoo -hoo, exactly the same as Visual Studio Code did. Um, we can also directly edit the csproj file here. See? In this, um, it, directly here um, in, in, in Visual Studio. And watch what you have here because I selected .NET Core when creating the project. I'm now running on .NET Core. This is not the newest version of .NET. What do I have to do in order to switch from old version, net core, to new version, net 5? I have to change the target framework monitor, Monica, net 5.0. Now I got it. Now I have a .NET 5 application. That's all you have to do. Really simple. So this target framework stuff here is really important. Let's run it. And you see, it says, hello world, everything as expected. Now in Visual Studio, uh, the full version, we have the possibility to change the target framework moniker directly here in the project settings. So this is the beauty of having an IDE, like Rider or Visual Studio. It gives you, it, it takes a lot of burden away from you. You don't have to manually change XML or JSON files. You just have a nice GUI. So if you, I, I see one or two, one Mac here, definitely you can work on Mac 
but not with Visual Studio, I'm very sorry. If you want to work natively on your Mac, you will need Rider or Visual Studio Code. Yes, I use Rider. You use Rider. Okay, then, that's fine. That's fine. Perfectly fine. Good. Clear? How did you get to this window? Yeah, right click on the project, properties, here, and then you get to this window. And there you choose application and you can choose the target framework. Even if you don't have installed .NET 5, you should see the .NET frameworks or .NET cores here. Is that the case? Good. Very good. Nice. Questions so far? No? Good. I expected that. Nice. Now, the next thing that I would like to do is I would like to add a class library in order so that, that everybody understands how working with class libraries works because we will regularly create class libraries. So if you want to add a class library to your solution, that's absolutely no problem. Right click the solution, add new project. Very, very simple. And then we will take a class library. Good. Let's call this, this class library the math library. We will not add very meaningful code. Yeah, this is the math library. The question is, what is the target framework monitor, Monica? Net standard 2.0. So, question. Can I use this library in a .NET framework app? Yes or no? Who is for yes? Who is for no? The yes are correct, because it is .NET Standard 2.0. Um, if you can remember what I showed you in my, my slides here, if I go back a few slides. Uh, da, 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 come on, go back. Ah, doesn't matter. It's so slow over the network. Ah, now it's here. <laughs> I was not patient enough. Here, we had this .NET implementation matrix, this one, and if you take a look, .NET Standard 2.0 is compatible with .NET Framework starting with 4.6. If I scroll to the right, if you use .NET Standard 2.1, it is no longer applicable for .NET Framework. So if I change the target framework moniker, the TFM, from .NET Standard 2.1 to 2.0 to 2.1, I get more APIs. I get more powerful base class libraries, but I lose compatibility with .NET Framework. Got it? So if we want to build a class library, we have to think of where do I want to be compatible with? And if I say, hey, I don't care about all this old stuff. I want to build the new cool stuff. Then what you have to do is net 5.0, you just change the target monitor to the latest version of .NET and everything is perfectly fine. Okay? Now we can build a little bit of code. We can, for instance, say, let's rename this class. This is called mathutil, very simple. Yes. And here we say public um, int add int x, int y, and this goes to x plus y, something like this, okay? Very, very trivial. Now let's rebuild this stuff. Okay, everything succeeded. And if we want to use this library here from our console app, we right click on the dependencies, add a project reference, choose the math library, and now we can add things. So. What we will do is we'll say console write line and we'll say the answer is something like this. And then we say, um, let me see, math util. Okay, let, let's make it a static class. If you don't know what static is, wait for another, um, for the next hour. Uh, math util dot add. 21, 21. So this is now, as you can see, oh, that's a beautiful. Yeah, now we are. This is now a cross-reference from a .NET 5 application to a .NET 5 class library. This is exactly what I wanted to show you. 
we can change the target framework moniker to .NET Standard 2.1, it will still work because the backward compatibility is given. Now let's see if it works. Let's run it. And the answer is of course 42. That's exactly what we expected. Good. Clear target framework moniker. CS Proch file. Any questions? I expected that. It's really basic stuff. Anything regarding C sharp that you don't know already? You know what a static function is? Haha. <laughs> what is a static function? This is not an exam. It's just just telling me what you think. If it's wrong, that's absolutely no problem. Imagine that um, a, a student from a first class comes to you and says, oh my god, I've heard about static functions. No idea what that is. What would you say? Uh, static function, you can use it without creating an instance of the class. Awesome. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. A static function is a function that can be called without creating an instance of the class. In our case, you cannot create an instance of the class because the class is static and therefore you cannot say new math util. Exactly. What do you think? Is it a good idea to use static functions a lot? No. No? Why? The answer is correct. No is correct. You, you use it, but you use it rather rarely. It is very hard to test static functions in a larger context. If you build larger applications, you typically avoid static functions only for rather simple things. Okay? They are, if you have a private function, that's a different thing. But um, for automated testing, you often avoid static functions. Why? We will learn about that um, in the course of in this course in the course of this year. Good. Now, now we have this nice little application that we have here. And if I build this application, let's take a look what's going on in my project folder. So if I take a look at the project folder, I have a bin folder, a debug folder, because we are currently building, as you can see it here, the debug version of the application in order to be able to debug it, the name suggested. And then you see down here, you have the target framework moniker depending on whether you build for .NET 5 or .NET Core App 3.1. We are focusing on .NET 5 here. So this is your debug version of the application. Here you have the executable. So if I go here and say, hey, give me a, a command shell here, and I say hello .NET XE, the answer should be 42, as you can see. So this is the executable that we could use. Would you ship this executable to your customers? No, because debug versions are horribly slow and way too, way too large. So whenever you want to ship software in a real world environment, you always switch from debug to release and then rebuild the whole stuff. Okay. And then if we click here, then we'll see a release version and .NET 5. And again, you have a .NET XE, and this is the version that you should ship to your customer. It is way better optimized than the debug version. We have a bunch of config files here, like these JSON files. We will not go into details here. You will rarely change these files. Sometimes you do, but yeah, you will rarely change them. Good? Nice. Now, to be honest, you will probably not ship the executable to your customer by copying it from the bin folder. What you will do instead is you will do a publish step here. Publish is the step for .NET, where you take your app and put it into the environment where you would like to run it. This could be the cloud. This could be a Docker container. Do you already know what Docker is? Yes? Good. This could be a folder or whatever else is installed on your machine. If I take a folder here, I can say, okay, put it into the publish directory. I click on finish and I can uh, change a bunch of, um, of settings. And the most important setting that I would like to discuss here now 
is the deployment mode. Let's talk about that. First, let's try the framework dependent mode. Okay, let's publish this guy. Good, publish worked. Let's go back here, publish, and you see, this is what we get. We get exactly, in the case of a console app, we get exactly what we get in the bin directory. For web apps, that's, that's different. But this is approximately 168K for a Hello World application. It's okay. Now let's switch this guy, and this is now important, please. Uh, let's switch the um, edit. Let's switch it from framework dependent to self-contained. Now we have to check which platform we want to build on. And this is the important stuff. Let's first try the Windows version and then discuss what this is all about. It takes longer. As you can see, publishing now takes much longer. That's normal. You don't do that every day. Well, you do it every day, but typically it is done by a server. Publish started, publish started. Let's be patient for a few more moments. Now it succeeded. Now let's go here in the publish folder. Oh my God. Um, here, see that? 230 files and in the middle of these files we will probably find our hello.net exe. The point of building a self-contained version of your app is that the recipient of your code does not have to install .net and that's a huge difference compared to the old .net framework world. So with .net nowadays you can build a working software that you can give to your customer on a memory stick, on an USB stick if you want. And your customer can run it without ever installing .NET on their machines. Understood? You can even go one step further and cross compile. If I click on edit, I can create um, a Linux version. You see that one? Save it, publish it. Let's see what's going to happen. Again, we have to be patient for a few more moments. Now we can build a Linux executable for our application that somebody can run on their Linux server or Docker container without ever installing the .NET framework. That's self-contained executables. Framework dependent executables are executables where you have to install .NET. Self-contained are executables where you don't have to install it. So if we go to Linux, you see, nice. Again, a lot of items, 192. And if we see here in the middle is our executable. See that one? I don't know if that will work. I will try it. This is a, see, this is Ubuntu. I created the .NET application, a Linux executable on this Ubuntu that I run here, I have not installed .NET. See it? But I still can run my app. And that's a very good, that's very good news for you, isn't it? Yeah. If you build a C-sharp app, you can use your Visual Studio on your machine and build a Linux executable for a web server, for instance, and run it on the web server without ever having to maintain an, a, a centrally installed .NET framework. Questions? Fine? Good? Good. Um, I, I don't know you yet so good, so, so I have to ask you, for whom was this stuff? Self-contained, framework contained, and so on, framework dependent, self-contained. Uh, self for, for whom was this new? Okay, nearly everybody, good. That's good, that's good. I don't want to bore you, don't get me wrong. Whenever you get the impression that I tell you something that you already know, interrupt me. You shouldn't be bored. Now, what else can we do? This one is rather new, produce single file, as you can see it here, and we will try it. Okay, so let's publish it again. Okay, 
Now? Oh, I forgot something. Let's publish it again. Good. I have to clean up a little bit. before I can find the files. So now, now I think I got everything just as I wanted it. Good. So let's check again. Then release net5. This is what I wanted to show you. Could you remember what we had before? Nearly 200 files. And you see what we now have? A single executable. We don't need this PDB files. It's just for debugging, for support purposes. We really just need this single executable. And if I go here, in this case, I'm still on Windows, uh, on Linux. If I run this guy, it says the answer is 42. I don't need to install .NET. I don't need to ship 200 files. All I ship is a single executable. And this executable has a size of, let's say here, 63K, and it contains the entire .NET framework inside of the 63K. That's pretty cool, isn't it? With this, we can just copy this file into a Docker container later when we build web applications, and we have a really small, elegantly small Docker container without any bloated .NET framework installed. We only have the stuff on the machine that we really need. Very simple to deploy, very simple to uh, to run in a cloud environment, for instance. Question? Is there a performance difference to the other versions? No, it's the same .NET framework. It's the same .NET framework. There is no difference. Internally, it's a zip file, and it is um, extracted in memory with .NET 5.0. If you run it on .NET 3.1 and you create a single file, it will even unzip your file into a temporary folder and then does exactly what it did before, run the executable from the temporary folder. Yeah, there is no performance difference. Well, it is, for, for starting the stuff, it's a, a tiny little bit slower because it has to unzip the stuff, but yeah, that, that's a micro-optimization, you can't forget about that. Got it? So, um, last one. This one is a very interesting one, and I have no idea whether this demo will now work. I click on it, trim unused assemblies, and I will republish it. It could fail because it's in preview. It's an early preview. It didn't fail during the compile phase, but let's see. Here we are. Nope. Wrong folder, publish, this is the right one. Ah, I see, see the difference? No longer 60 something K, but now 22 K. Let's see whether it still runs. I've seen it, you can pull down the hand, give me a second, okay? So, woohoo, this is brand new stuff. This is the so-called linker or trimmer. This is in early preview. I'm not sure if it will be completely ready for production in .NET 5, maybe somebody announced it already and I don't know about it. What, what's done here is the, um, the, publish, the, the .NET publisher takes a look at the executable and finds all parts of libraries of .NET which are not used. In our application, we for instance don't use JSON. We don't use XML. So why having all this XML and JSON stuff of the framework put into our executable? It just uses space. We have to store this space, and if we store something in the cloud, we have to pay for it. We have to transfer larger files. If we transfer something out of the cloud, we have to pay for it. If there is a security bug in the JSON serializer, why do we have to update our application if we don't even use the JSON uh, serializer? That's the idea of this trimmer. It removes all the stuff that is not needed. There is another word that you will probably hear regularly when you work with um, 
JavaScript, Angular, for instance, it's called tree shaking. Ever heard of it? Tree shaking algorithms. Think of a tree with apples on it. You go to the tree and you shake the tree and all the apples fall down. It's just like what's going on here. The .NET trimmer goes to your XE and shakes the XE and all the things that are not linked to your application just fall down. And therefore, you get a smaller executable. But be careful with this feature. Uh, there are a lot of traps, a lot of things can go wrong. I would not use it in production yet, but it's nice to, to play with it. Good. So let me quickly check. Good. We have nine minutes left. And that's the things that I wanted you to show. Let's quickly do a short recap what we have learned in the last 40 minutes. I showed you that .NET does not just run in the Visual Studio environment, but it runs in the command line, .NET tool. We created a console app and we took a look at the config file. I told you something about target framework monikers, TFM. And I showed you how you can switch from .NET Core to .NET Standard to .NET 5, things like that. We talked about class libraries and how they relate to .NET 5, .NET Core, and .NET Framework. We also took a look at how to publish an application once we are done. I showed you how to quickly create a debug version, a release version. We talked about the differences between um, framework dependent and self-contained self deployments. And we took a quick look at the trimmer. Don't worry if you didn't remember all the details, the things that I showed you now here, we will use them throughout the entire course until the end of the year. So you will master all these functionalities at the end of the course, I can promise you that. Good. Any questions? So far, yeah. Um, the self-contained file, could I take this one file and for instance put it on a Raspberry Pi and run it there? Uh, yes, you can, uh, but you need to compile it for a different platform. Let's see if I can quickly find it. Here you can compile it to ARM, and then it should run. You can also try to compile it to OS X, and then it should run on a Mac. Definitely. You see, the reason why I started with that is because .NET is in many cases, for many people, an underestimated platform. Many people, if they hear .NET and C Sharp, think of old, boring WinForms. And when they hear Docker and Kubernetes and cloud computing, they only think about languages like Go and Rust, the whole new stuff if you want. But that's simply not true. .NET changed drastically over the last 10 years. And believe me, I code in Go, I code in Rust, I code in C Sharp, the language where I'm most productive nowadays when building applications, web or desktop apps or, or whatever, is C Sharp. It is super robust, you get so much documentation, you have really nice IDEs, and the result is not the smallest piece of software that you can ever get. You can definitely build faster and smaller applications using C++ or Rust, but you will not get things done. It will just take forever until your app really runs. C Sharp is a really good compromise between developer productivity on the one hand side and efficiency and cloud readiness on the other side. And this is why we will focus on .NET and C Sharp for the rest of the course. Good. Let's quickly recap what you have to do until uh, for the next weeks. I edit all the things to WebOntis2. Install the necessary software on your laptops. That's priority number one. We need to have that next week because next week we'll do a lot of coding. First. Second, don't forget to choose your lightning talk. If you want, you can do next week a lightning talk. Yeah? If, if you want, just added to the GitHub repository, you sent me an email, I'm perfectly fine with it. Otherwise, choose a date, add your topic, and we are looking forward to your, to your lightning talk. 
add the lightning talk to the GitHub repository and uh, please finish that at some time in the next two or three weeks, okay? Good. Is everything clear? Did we have a good start together? Yeah? yeah? That's good. Then I'm done with my content. I say thank you for listening and yeah, we will continue immediately after a short break because we have another two hours for practical stuff, but we will have a second teacher joining us and we will tell you how we will organize the, uh, the PROO um, practical um, stuff in, in a few minutes, okay? Good, thank you. Uh, we will now have a break until, let's see, 10.55.